looks fantastic. so much for that little exercise. If you ladies and gentlemen with the flags could withdraw over to the sides again. Kitas to sing our national anthem. this week to gathering here to mourn a tragic step backward. We gather instead to celebrate the courage of the human spirit in the defense of freedom and the hope that the freedom won by the nations of Eastern Europe in the last two years may soon spread to the Baltics, Ukraine, and the Soviet republics. We gather as well, however, to remember the over one billion people who still live under the jackboot tyranny of communism. We begin tonight as we have always begun with prayer, and I would ask Father Miroslav Stesu to come forward to pray with us. Чая Ми діти цього народу любимо всі народи, а передусім любимо щиро християнською любов'ю наш український навіть. Тим, хто з любові до нього, а радше з любові до нього. God and Father, Amen. In the name of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Ім'я Отця і Сина і Святого Духа, Амінь. Ім'я Отця і Сина і Святого Духа, Амінь. A 
again this year, hundreds of thousands of people all around the globe are gathering in Black Ribbon Day rallies like this one. There will be 37 such rallies today on four continents. These rallies have been seen every year behind what used to be the Iron Curtain and are reported to the people behind the Bamboo Curtain as well. Your support, your very presence here, year after year, has helped immeasur immeasurably to kindle the spirit of freedom wherever communism has ruled. The results of your efforts can be seen today in the new map of Europe and in the new world agenda. For six years, you have given voice and face and form to the hopes of those without freedom, letting those people know they were not alone. The victories of the last three years have been your victories, and the hope that grows in, so in the Soviet Union tonight has sprung from seeds that you have helped to plant and nurture. Many elected officials have helped us keep this dream alive, both leaders of our organizations, organizations of exiles here in Canada, and many officials and government representatives who have helped us fight for freedom here in Toronto and across the land. They are gathered here with us in the front, and I should like to take just a moment to recognize them. You have heard from the Right Reverend Miroslav Stasiu of the Ukrainian Catholic Church. With him is the very, rhetoric, very Reverend Petro Bubli of the Ukrainian Autocephalus Orthodox Church, who will deliver the closing prayer this evening. Tommy O'Donoghue, Counselor for Ward 3. Yuri Shimko. President of the World Congress for the Ukrainian. Mr. Yaroslav Sokolik, President of the Ukrainian Canadian Congress, Toronto Branch. Yaroslav is also a director of Black Ribbon Day, by the way, and one of the senior organizers of these events for many years. From the Lithuanian Canadian community, Mr. Al Vitunas, a director of Black Ribbon Day and a leader of the community. Mr. Al Pasivius, uh, media past director of the Lithuanian Canadian Congress. Mr. Herbertus Stepetis, Vice President of the Lithuanian Canadian Community. And Mr. Harris Lapas, the Council General of Lithuania. From the Estonian Canadian Community, Mr. Las Leva, President of the Estonian Central Council of Canada and President of the Balkan Federation. Gilmar Heinsu, the Honorary Council General of Estonia, who is with us again. From the Latvian Canadian community, Mr. Beteris Zarens, President of the Latvian National Federation of Canada. From the Polish Canadian Congress, Mr. Marek Maliki, President of the Canadian Congress. Did Mr. Maliki make it? Evidently not, but his people are here. Mrs. Alina Kennedy, Treasurer of the Polish Congress Executive Board. She is here with us. Mr. Les Wilk, the Canadian Polish Congress Executive District for Toronto. And Dr. Ivan Borgoya, the uh, Director of the Canadian Congress. She is here with us. These are the people who have helped us, both in City Hall and in the legislatures, and in your communities, to keep the great dream alive that has meant so much to so many people. Now, one of the things that has happened each year is that the dignitaries in the city and municipal and federal officials have seen enough to be living in one of the world's democratic nations, it is often difficult to imagine life in a country where individual liberties are relatively non-existent. Unfortunately, many of the world's people, peace, freedom, and democracy are merely words rather than a fact of life. Through the excellent efforts of the International Black Ribbon Day Committee, our consciousness is frequently prompted to awareness of the plight of these individuals and nations. Each year, Canadians and supporters around the globe rally to rejoice in the accomplishments of this just cause and to celebrate the promise of freedom and liberty for all nations. Recent events in Eastern Europe can only strengthen the dedication and determination as citizens throughout the world continue the struggle to bring freedom and quality of life to all. 
On behalf of my colleagues on City Council, it is a pleasure to applaud the work of the committee to support its objectives and to proclaim this day, International Black Ribbon Day in the City of Toronto, <coughs> signed the Mayor of Toronto, Art Adelton. <laughs> Fight more than we've ever fought before to ensure that the independence will come soon for all of us. Thank you very much. I see a lady down in the last row of our dignitary section with whom I've had the pleasure of working for many, many years. And I missed her the first time around and I won't miss her again. Vera Roller from the Czechoslovak community. In years past, the province of Ontario proclaimed this Black Ribbon Day for the province. Uh, that was not done this year, but we have received a communique from Premier Ray, which I would like to read to you now. Uh, it is addressed to the Black Ribbon Day Committee and it says, Our government firmly supports democracy and human rights in Eastern Europe as elsewhere in the world. With the events that are now unfolding in the Soviet Union, we must reaffirm our support for democracy there. I hope the democratic reforms which have been achieved cannot be repealed. Yours sincerely, Bob Ray. We have also received a message from the Prime Minister of Canada on the occasion of International Black Ribbon Day, August 23rd. Momentous events have shaken the Soviet Union this week. Communist hardliners used the brute force to turn back the clock and failed. They were defeated by civilians armed only with their belief in democracy. This week in Moscow has been a testament to the strength of the spirit of freedom. For over a year, Vilnius, Riga, and Tallinn have been the targets of brutal political and military pressure. This week, the Baltic states were once again in the forefront of the struggle for liberty. Estonians, Latvians, and Lithuanians held fast when confronted with military might. On this, the 52nd anniversary of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, we honor the memory of those who died in Vilnius and Riga in January, and more recently on the Lithuanian borders. And we praise the courage of the, those who this week have been fighting to resist repression. We have rec never recognized de jure the incorporation of the Baltic states into the Soviet Union. Consequently, we welcome the declarations of independence by the democratically elected Baltic governments. All parties should now recognize the need to respond to the democratic wishes of the Baltic peoples in speedy negotiations on independence from the Prime Minister of Canada. I've also been handed a news release from Barbara McDougall. It reads in part, it reads in part, I'm only going to read one paragraph. <laughs> that the Soviet coup failed is in large part due to the courage of the Baltic peoples and their unfailing commitment to democracy. Barbara, that's true. But that comes from your public relations people. <laughs> the people in the government of Canada look to, ex to its external affairs minister to speak clearly, decisively, and from the outset on behalf of democracy and against tyranny. Barbara, you blew it. And we don't think we have several very distinguished speakers to address you this evening. I should first like to call upon my member of parliament, Mr. Jesse Fliss, the member of Park for Parkdale High Park, who will speak to us on behalf of the of the, uh, the federal parties and the Liberal Party of Canada. Jesse? <laughs> Mr. Chairman, Right Reverend Fathers, Honorary Council Generals and Councils of the Baltic uh, States, but most of all I'd like to recognize the representatives of the various ethnocultural groups because it's through your leadership 
that we get together here and through the Black Ribbon Committee at least once a year in defense of democracy and so that we and the world can experience peace with freedom, freedom with peace. I do have a message from the leader of the official opposition, the Honorable Jean Chrétien, which I would like to share with you. I am pleased to send greetings to all gathered to remember Black Ribbon Day, the day of the signing of the molotov ribbentrop Treaty. How paradoxical, paradoxical is today's ceremony in light of past week's events that occurred in the Soviet Union? As nations celebrate the courage of the Russian people in successfully challenging the illegitimate military takeover of their country, a renewed call for democracy freedom of speech and liberty rings loud and clear around the world. The will of the people has triumphed, and together we have witnessed the victory that the hope for democracy ignites. However, as we take time to remember the reason behind Black Ribbon Day, we must reflect upon the reality that for many people there is still a long way to go before they too can participate in the dynamics dynamics of a true democratic society. As Canadians, we must never take for granted the freedoms, rights, and privileges we enjoy. The legitimacy and any democracy is built upon the freedom of its citizens to hold free elections, to elect the leaders and representatives of their choice, and to openly debate all issues of importance to them. Human rights and freedoms are not privileges only for the elite, but entitlements for all. Canada is part of the evolving democratic experience, and our future lies in our collective capacity to negotiate our differences, to accommodate change, and to appreciate the rich pluralism of our nation. I believe that principles of federalism favor the growth of our cultural diversity, and that the Canadian ideal is worth pursuing and improving for the benefit of all. My best wishes to all for a most meaningful celebration and for continued success in our shared goals of international peace and democracy, signed Jean Chrétien. I've been asked by the organizers to bring a few words from our caucus of the official opposition and from me personally because of my involvement with you, my visits to Russia, Ukraine, the three Baltic states. So if you'll allow me a few more minutes, Mr. Chairman, I would like to say that 52 years ago today, Ribbentrop acting for Hitler, Molotov acting for Stalin, signed the notorious Molotov-Ribbentrop non-aggression pact. Non-aggression? was the treaty which divided Poland in half and wiped Poland off the map less than three weeks later, non-aggression? Was the Kremlin's 1940 illegal annexation of the three Baltic states non-aggression? No, it was a secret document which violated the rights of innocent people. Today, we are here to remember that secret document in, def in defense of democracy in defense of peace and freedom. Remember that for many years there was totalitarian oppression in the Soviet Union and the satellite countries. Remember all the secrets, the people who disappeared, the people like my own wife Sophie when she was nine weeks old were herded up in the middle of the night and taken to Siberia. We must remember the writers who were jailed for telling the truth the people who spoke of democracy and then disappeared forever. We wear these black ribbons to make sure we always remember the people in the world who do not have the same rights and freedoms we take for granted in Canada. Even in Canada, there are many people, in fact, I'm sure many of you here today, who spent a tense week and sleepless nights worrying about the relatives and your friends in the Soviet Union, in the Baltics, in the Ukraine, in Russia. Those of you 
with Hungarian, Czech, Slovak connections, we're probably reminded of the relatives and friends you lost in 1956 and 68. You will have been glued to your televisions and radios, and like me, you saw our Canadian Secretary of State for External Affairs, the Honorable Barbara McDougall, take a very soft stand against the coup by the conservative wing of the Communist Party in the Soviet Union. In fact, the headline in front of the Ottawa newspaper, Ottawa Citizen, read, and I quote, Canada willing to recognize junta, says minister. End of heading. When all of us here today watched in horror, Barbara McDougall, speaking for Prime Minister Mulroney, left the impression that perhaps a return to hardline government was not so bad. Here is a direct quote from Barbara McDougall. Canada is willing to recognize the new junta in the Soviet Union as soon as it shows it is in control of the communist nation, end of quote. That is our Secretary of State. When a few people can use fear, intimidation, and the army to oppress the rest of the population. In Russia, ordinary people, linked arms, circled the Russian parliament buildings, defied a curfew, and all through the night used their own bodies as a shield against the army. They won, the Soviet tanks moved out. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we're talking about living in peace and freedom. February of this year, I was in Yugoslavia, and I saw both Croatians and Serbians living in fear, talking to them. They expressed their fear. You could see the fear on their faces. That is not living in peace and freedom. In, within the past year and a half, I had the good fortune of, as I mentioned earlier, visiting Russia, Ukraine. I made two visits to Lithuania on their election on March the 17th on the re referendum. I visited Estonia, Latvia, and in talking to President Rutel, President Gerbanis, President Landsbergis, talking to the prime ministers of these Baltic states, talking with their foreign ministers, whether it was visiting there or when they come and visit here, they all give us one very clear message. They will achieve their independence not through military might, but through the democratic process. Our next speaker has so many titles, I had to ask her if she could get them all on her letterhead. Helene Ziemba is the Minister of Citizenship. She has responsibility for human rights. She has responsibility for race relations. She has responsibility for seniors' issues. And she has responsibility for disability issues. Tonight, she has the responsibility to speak to us for just a very few minutes. Helene Ziemba from the Ontario Government. Thank you for the kind introduction and thank you for inviting me today. I am pleased to be here on behalf of the province of Ontario, the government of Ontario, and especially the Premier of Ontario, Bob Ray. As you know, our Premier has stood very strong and fast on the resolve of human rights and democracy and social democracy around the world. We are here today in recognition of the human spirit, the human spirit across the world. Not just in Eastern European, but we have seen the struggles of human spirit in China as well. And I, I noticed some representatives from the Chinese community earlier. People who have decided that they want to have freedom and democracy. Yes, we are privileged in Canada to have democracy. But it's not an accident that we have democracy. The reason we have democracy, because our 
people who came to live in this country chose to do so, so that they could express their rights, the right of freedom to political decisions, the right of freedom for religious beliefs, and the right of freedom to live with their neighbors every day on an equal basis. Dear brothers and sisters in freedom, as I watch the uh, rainbow colors of liberty before me, it reminds us of the scene in Red Square where when democracy prevailed, we indeed saw a rainbow of flags of free peoples and not one single flag of the Union of the USSR. That is the new reality that we are witnessing today in a process that you voiced, that you determinately, as members of a community, speaking on behalf of your peoples who were silenced for decades, stubbornly, year after year, united as brothers and sisters in freedom on Black Ribbon Day, came here with these multicolored flags. And Mr. Chairman, the name Black Ribbon was chosen to remind the world of the horrors of the sacrifice of the victims of the tragedy which had led to the enslavement of millions. But I tell you today sincerely that this year marks the last year when you will see a black ribbon. It will be a ribbon of rainbows. It will be a ribbon of freedom. For as we have watched since 1989, Poland free, Czechoslovakia free, Hungary free, Romania and Bulgaria still struggling towards that freedom almost achieved for their people. Croatia, Slovenia, Albania, and we have watched how Lithuanian, the Lithuanian nation in difficult hours proclaimed its independence not to be recognized by any state except Iceland. And as we watch today, Estonia and Latvia, at the most difficult hour when tanks and armored vehicles and the possibility of horror and terror and bloodshed falling on their peoples declared independence. And it is because of their independence and the courage of these nations that the world will be secure, that there will be peace, that there will be stability. And Jesse Fliss, I do not want to make this rally today a political forum. But Jesse, I must tell you, I share your views. And I also want to remind everyone of a respected leader of a Canadian political party who recently also said that the nationalisms and the developments in Eastern Europe create the greatest dangers to world stability and peace. I did not agree with him then, neither do you, Jesse. And that was none other than Jean Chrétien. I hope, Jean, that you have changed. I believe you have. And here it is not an issue of one party or another. It is an issue of the perceptions of politicians of all parties who must unite today and speak out in facing the changing realities. And it is the responsibilities of us, Elaine and Jesse and myself and you gathered here to educate our politicians of every color and every stripe.
We are witnessing today a revolution that should have happened in November 1917, when democracy, when national independence for the peoples of the Russian Empire at the time glimmered with rays of hope to be cut down by a then successful coup d'etat, a successful Bolshevik putsch, a successful junta, who crushed that day of hope, a junta which destroyed a constitutional government, which militarily invaded free nations that declared their independence. That illegal Bolshevik junta of three quarters of a century ago, led by the Communist Party, with Felix Dzerzhinsky's Cheka, NKVD, and KGB, reigned and stayed in power for almost 75 years at the cost of millions and millions of victims. And it is because men and women swore on their gra graves that history today is repeating itself, that we have gone in a full circle after 74 years, that democracy today is no more hostage, is no more held in blackmail, is no more being bartered on the tables of international diplomacy as it was cut off and beaten with the hammer and sickle. Today, democracy is being resurrected before your very eyes. It is reborn in the streets of Moscow, Leningrad, Vilnius, Tallinn, Riga, Minsk, Kiev, Yerevan, Tbilisi, etc. Never to be silenced ever again in prisons, labor camps, and mass graves. Never. The spirit of national liberty and individual freedom and democracy has triumphed, ladies and gentlemen. This is why we are here today to reinforce that and to rejoice, even still at difficult times ahead. It has triumphed never to be crushed again. It is the individual that has triumphed over, over a police state. It is men of courage and determination, like Boris Yeltsin, who have now taken on the stage. Today's real heroes, however, are the people. People like you. People of all races. Peoples of all nationalities of a former Soviet Union that is no more. Of an enslaved Communist Party that is no more. That has reached the end of the road. of a repressed and deceiving Marxist-Leninist ideology which is now totally bankrupt, which is no more, of a people terrorized by the KGB whose control over human lives has now toppled and is toppling like the statue of its founder, Dzerzhinsky. You know, when Edward Shevardnadze yesterday, speaking to the thousands and thousands of people in front of the Russian parliament building, suggested that those who had died and who were crushed in the attempted and failed coup d'etat, that the bodies of those young men be buried on the side behind the Kremlin wall where lies supposedly great men. Even, he said, if they, some of them will have to be removed. And while he commented this, a man shouted out, it is in the mausoleum in Red Square that these bodies should be buried and stand for witnesses for centuries in place of Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. Perhaps that may be the path. We are witnessing, ladies and gentlemen, a new balance of power where national republics will now decide 
whether or not to reshape an empire, an old empire once held by force into a commonwealth to be born by choice. And as you and I and those leaders of our communities who have been on the phone, who have been standing by by fax machines, listening to the latest news, as we listen to the developments and what our nations are saying to you today, this is what the world is now being told in no uncertain terms. First, that state terror and the former institutions of that state terror and state control, the Communist Party of the Soviet Union and its affiliates in the KGB, will be declared illegal, unconstitutional, and outlaw this criminal organization as has been done in Latvia and Lithuania and Estonia. Secondly, they are telling us that any new leader who pretends to lead the country and its peoples into reform towards a new world order, any leader in the Soviet Union who today is still naive to believe that this future can be built by reforming, by resurrecting these institutions, is just as insane to say this in August 1991 as some politician would have said in August 1945 that legitimacy should continue to be given for the continued existence of a Nazi party and the Gestapo which can be reformed. The Communist Party and the KGB cannot be reformed just as you cannot reform Nazism and the Gestapo. We are being told by our peoples that anyone who will be pressuring the republics and the former Soviet Union to, who have declared outright independence or state sovereignty, that they must urgently sign a new union treaty without delay, otherwise democracy will be endangered. Such a man must be living in fantasy land. Such a man must be dreaming or simply re-echoing the same words that were used and the same pressure tactics that were applied by the so-called Gang of Eight who were recently deposed. In short, such a person understands heroics is committing political suicide. Today, the Union is dead. If we are to build a new order, it will be built and secured through the peaceful dissolution of the Soviet Union into free sovereign nation states united with other members of the international community by choice, not by force. They will decide the future relationships among themselves, progressing to build a better life for their citizens in a safer world throughout the entire planet Earth, through mutual cooperation and respect as equal partners of a common human family. And so, as we watch today, the progress, difficult yet, by those nations and peoples who are seeking recognition, who are waiting for Canada to recognize them as independent states. As we watch today, Poland, despite all the obstacles and criticisms, agreeing to open the first embassy in Kiev and that a Ukrainian embassy reciprocally will be open in Warsaw 
That is the example that the world should follow. Similar moves are now being made by Hungary. I understand that the European Parliament and the European Council is now deciding whether or not and when to recognize the independence of the Baltic states. I tell you, that recognition will be given in the next few weeks, if not in the next few days. It is inevitable. And I want to read to you a communique that I received 45 minutes before coming here to this rally. Six hours from now, in Kiev, the Ukrainian parliament will meet and will vote and decide on the following six points. Number one, a vote to declare the total independence of Ukraine. Number two, to place under control all of the security forces in Ukrainian soil under the hands of the Ukrainian parliament. Number two, to demand and to implement the resignation of all leaders and high officials who supported the coup d'etat. Number four, to ban all the activities of the Communist Party of Ukraine on the territory of Ukraine and to nationalize the Communist Party property. <laughs> Number five, to nationalize all the property of the Soviet Union on Ukrainian soil. <laughs> and finally, to set up the creation of a separate Ukrainian currency and Ukrainian army. In concluding, ladies and gentlemen, this is why we are here. We are here to demand that the leaders of the international community should have noted, as I have said at the beginning, that there was not a single Union flag in Red Square when Yeltsin spoke to the people, when democracy triumphed. But there was a harmony of many flags, flags of freedom, flags of a new hope, flags of all peoples, united by a common goal and a common destiny, to live in peace with liberty and justice. Long live freedom and democracy. Long live freedom to the individual and liberty to all nations. One of these days I'm going to ask Yuri and Avokitas to have a voice contest to see which one of them can fill this place up more completely. They're both wonderful. Thank you very much, Yuri. I would like to call now on Mr. Las Levat, the president of the Baltic Federation, and one of the most tireless workers of Black Ribbon Day, to speak to us for just a couple of minutes. Las, where are you? There you are. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, media attention has been focused on the Baltic states this week, but standing here together today, I say that it won't be over until not only the Baltic states, but Ukraine, the other Soviet republics, including Russia, are free. The Baltic states have taken a courageous uh, step to consolidate their progress to de facto independence. Amongst these initiatives are reaffirmations of the independence of the states, bringing to account those who assisted with the attempted coup, declaring illegal those groups who have called for and acted in reversing the independence drives, setting up practical mechanisms to establish institutions for de facto independence, including those dealing with public safety, 
and unifying the energies of sometimes disparate representative groups, all of whom who have independence as their end goal. The momentum in the Baltic states, and indeed in, throughout the Soviet Union, has been very encouraging. And this momentum can be boosted by the West, but the timing is crucial. It is evident from positions taken in the last two days that Western governments now feel obliged to support Baltic independence. These feelings of obligation must be translated into action immediately. <laughs> we, we know that Western governments have today more power and influence than they can even imagine they have. If Gorbachev's answer to Western demands is, I'll get around to considering it when I've got my own house in order, that answer will again be yet, and this is not acceptable now. <laughs> Gorbachev's debt to the West and Boris Yeltsin, the debt to the West and to Boris Yeltsin must be collected now. The, the West must demand disengagement from the Baltic states, from the occupied by Baltic states, nothing less will do. Thank you. Just before we go on, I wanted to mention there is a table over here uh, just in front of the canopy by the fence. Uh, we have a book there tonight that I wanted to bring to your attention. Uh, the Black Ribbon Day movement uh, commemorates the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact, and a gentleman who was commissioned actually by Black Ribbon Day to write a history of the pact and its consequences has produced an excellent book called Partners in Tyranny. Mr. John Koloski is the author, and uh, there really isn't any finer way to teach our people than to teach them our history. And that book is just $5, and it's on sale over here at the table. I would encourage all of you to have a copy of that book for yourselves. It's been written in the last six years. You helped write it. They helped make it possible. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you now the Vice Chairman of International Black Ribbon Day, a good friend of mine, and a great friend of yours, Mr. David Somerville. remember slavery, but we're also here to celebrate freedom. And I ask you all to rise and raise your voices in the name of freedom and join me. Freedom! 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 We have the freedom now to say that and our friends behind what was once the Iron Curtain can join us in saying that too. Dear friends, five years ago, about 5,000 good citizens who believe in freedom gathered here together to first commemorate Black Ribbon Day. But those who gathered here did not just believe in freedom, they took a stand for freedom. Many of you, most of you, were here in 1986. Take pride. Take pride. We gathered to commemorate the anniversary of that black day in history when two gangster states, Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union, signed an evil pact to carve up Europe between them. On that first day, we were joined by tens of thousands of others in cities around the world. They also remembered, they also grieved. At that first Black Ribbon Day, 
somewhat carried away by the success of the movement, I declared that this is the beginning of the end of the Soviet Empire. Now that was somewhat immodest. But today, on Black Ribbon Day, 1991, that evil empire is dispirited, it's disorganized, it is on its knees. You, all of you, have played an important part in bringing it to its knees. From the beginning, we joined together those twin nightmares, Nazism and Soviet communism. Their symbols, the swastika and the hammer and sickle, have meant death, degradation, torture, impoverishment for hundreds upon hundreds of millions of people. Those symbols which together we have brought to the attention of the world have entered the consciousness of the world. During the blessedly short-lived Soviet coup of only days ago, Lithuanian President Landsberger said that the coup plotters wanted to finish the business of the Nazi Soviet pact. Yesterday, President Landsberger called for a Nuremberg-style war crimes tribunal for the coup plotters. I think we should give them a fair trial and then hang them. <laughs> Most wonderfully, this morning I watched television footage of a, of a swastika sprayed on the very walls of the KGB headquarters in Moscow. I watched the statue of that devil incarnate, Felix Drzezinski, the founder of the Soviet terror police, being toppled in Moscow. Only two hours ago, I watched more footage of the statue of Lenin in front of the Communist Party headquarters in Estonia being destroyed. I have a, a small secret to share with you. I was in Tallinn, Estonia, standing at the foot of that statue of Lenin in front of the Communist Party headquarters about a year ago and I had to very discreetly spit on it. <laughs> that is now scrap metal. <laughs> Only two hours ago, I watched a BBC international report carried nationally in Canada of freedom lovers throughout the Baltic states lighting signal fires throughout their three countries to commemorate Black Ribbon Day. <laughs> Today, my friends, take pride and give thanks that we could use our freedoms to help those who have lost theirs. To all of you, I say a simple but profoundly sincere thank you. that heroes are born, not made. I don't know whether that's true, but if someone back here just mentioned to me a moment ago that we ought to mention a hero. There is somebody who's come out of the events in the last few days whose courage has been absolutely extraordinary. One of those unique individuals who proves what those of us in this movement genuinely believe, that it is the individual effort of people that makes freedom. Our voices have been heard cheering behind the Iron Curtain before. And I know he can hear our voice if we cheer him tonight. I would like to raise with you the name of Boris Yeltsin. A remarkable man of extraordinary courage. And a man I'm certain that we are all going to see more of in the years to come. David mentioned a statue being torn down, a statue of Lenin or, or somebody or other in Moscow. 
<laughs> Maybe they'll put up a statue of Boris Yeltsin. I'd like to suggest that there's a statue of Lenin that also ought to come down, and it's standing here in Toronto, down at Harvard. <laughs> I'm not just sure who it is who thinks that that obscenity is art, but I know what you and I think about it, and we don't think that it belongs in the city of peace, freedom, and democracy. May I introduce to you now a very dear friend, a man of enormous courage and great vision, the man who conceived the Black Ribbon Day, brought it to fruition, and has carried it around on his back with all the rest of us now for six years. Ladies and gentlemen, Marcus Hess. Good evening. It's a wonderful evening. The sky is bluer than it was a week ago and the trees are greener. There's more freedom in the air. This is a wonderful, fabulous time in the history of mankind. Perhaps the greatest thing that has happened in our lifetime. Six years ago, when we rallied in this very spot, 1986, Eastern Europe was in the grip of the Soviet Red Army. The Afghan war was at its full height. Freedom was a silent dream in the Soviet Union. The Berlin Wall stood impenetrable as ever. The Molotov Ribbentrop Pact was still in effect and still honored by the Kremlin. A year later, 1987, on August 23rd, Black Ribbon Day was celebrated in Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, the first unpunished demonstrations in the Soviet <laughs> Union. The next year, 1988, the flags of Ukraine, of the Baltics, were flown in public and freedoms began to appear. Freedoms of speech, freedoms of expression. A year later, 1989, the 50th anniversary of that dastardly day, the Berlin Wall fell with a resounding, joyous crash. The people of Poland, of Czechoslovakia, of Hungary took power away from the Communist Party, away from the dictators that had ruled for many years. The winds of freedom swept through their ancient capitals. On Black Ribbon Day, 1989, the people of Ukraine, of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia linked arm to arm in a human chain of over a million people to show that yes indeed the genie was out of the bottle people were speaking in unison people were speaking in a solid chorus that shook the empire and on august 20 on december 24th 1989 the day before Christmas, the Soviet Union repealed the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. Six months later, Lithuania declared independence. An independence that is protected by hearts against steel, defended by the quiet courage and bravery of the people themselves against the murderous Oman, the Black Beret, and their weaponry. The Gang of Eight did not understand that the tools of terror that was used so effectively by Lenin, by Stalin, by Khrushchev, by Brezhnev, were no longer available. They did not understand that the power of the nation had been transferred from the regime to the people. The people had tasted freedom and the people understood. The coup d'etat was not defeated by Yeltsin, the freely elected president of Russia alone, but by the people under his leadership. The Soviet Union has changed forever. The work of 
the dissidents, the work of the citizens of the repressed nations of Ukraine, of Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, of the nations that were repressed in Eastern Europe, of Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Romania, the years of quiet suffering, of holding their cultures together under the onslaught of Russification, the long hours and labors put forth for the dream of freedom by the exiled peoples in foreign lands, the works and labors by the free world congresses and federations of Ukrainians, Polish, Poles, Czechs, Slovaks, Hungarians, Estonians, Latvians, Lithuanians, and others. And the work of freedom-minded Canadians, freedom-minded Americans, freedom-minded Europeans has now reached fruition. It is not a time for weak-kneed politicking, but a time for standing firm and resolutely. On this, the sixth Black Ribbon Day, on behalf of the Canadian Black Ribbon Day Committee, I call upon Prime Minister Brian Mulroney and the Government of Canada to open full diplomatic relations with those nations, to request that the Soviet government withdraw its armies from republics, from those sovereign republics that it illegally occupied. And we are calling on Brian Mulroney, Prime Minister of Canada, and the Government of Canada to extend full recognition and diplomatic relations to those republics. And I ask that every person here, realizing the urgency that we are in at the moment, to take five minutes tomorrow or tonight and write a letter addressed to the Prime Minister demanding these two points. Address the letter to the Prime Minister of Canada, House of Commons, Ottawa, no stamp is required. Let's send those letters today. I wish to thank, there's a postal strike, so call them. <laughs> Fax him. Call and collect by telephone. I wish to thank the people of Toronto who have supported the Black Ribbon Day Committee through these last years, through these last six years. You started a wave in 1986 that gathered momentum and assisted in the demise of the evil empire, that won sweet independence for nations far, far away. Independence whose arrival was hurried by your unified efforts. Today is a day for joyful celebration, and I can think of no better way to celebrate this day than here with you today. God bless you and thank you. Be present. Bless, O Lord, all peoples in Europe. Grant them good health and prosperity and enlighten their heart so that they walk in the path and their commandments, Shion. Keep under thy holy protection our leaders and benefactors and all those who truly work for the enhancement of their glory and for the good of their people. Amen. Minä voin olla 
panemme tähän ja että se aru on tiamiset se, se kauniius, jota me tänään kuulisimme. Se tulee pistikkoisesti kuuluksessa. Siinä on neljä tuhdusen kooli, jossa on avannutama sydämet ja suut Jumalalle, kuinka meille ja 